All right, so like I mentioned in my impressions video of the Steam Deck a few weeks back, even if you're just playing it right out of the box with only Steam approved content, you're still likely to encounter some quirks here and there that you'll have to address. Maybe it's just like a small configuration change that you'll have to make, or maybe it'll be remapping a controller, but sooner or later you're gonna run across something weird that you're probably going to have to fix on the Steam Deck or address so a game's more to your liking. So with that in mind, one of the things that I started doing was trying to write down and just keep a record of the things that I found along the way, or things that I thought might be helpful tips or advice for somebody who's new to the Steam Deck. So that's what today's video is all about, is just me kind of working my way through the system and talking about some weird things that I found here and there that I wish I had known before I started diving in and just really exploring the Steam Deck proper. So with that being said, what I'm going to do right now is actually work my way from the outside of the system in, initially talking about kind of the external kind of hardware of the Steam Deck, then its ports, then the operating system and experience of like the user interface and then finally gameplay itself and some tips and tweaks that I found that might be helpful to you if you're just diving into the Steam Deck for the first time. So all that being said let's just go ahead and start with the hardware and the exterior of the system and one of the first things that I would recommend as a tip for the Steam Deck is to make sure you have a solid regular place to charge it. Now I talked about the practical advantages of making sure you had a good stand for the system just so you could have it you know, easier to view if you're looking at it in desktop mode. But beyond that, if you're gonna charge this thing, make sure you have a regular place to charge it that is a safe spot. And the reason I say that is, even though I think the build quality on the Steam Deck is totally great, uh, there is something about it because it's heavier, I think, and it's kind of a slippery system in the hand. I always worry that if I just like set it on like a table or a desk or something like that, that I'm going to accidentally knock it off. So make sure you have a safe place to charge it, or at the very least, uh, you're gonna put it low to the ground so it won't possibly fall and break. Again, I don't think the hardware's really been out in the wild long enough, and I certainly don't want to do a drop test with my own unit to see how resilient that hardware is. But yeah, there's just something that is a little bit nerve-wracking for me because I, maybe it's because they're just so hard to get right now that I'm thinking that way. But yeah, every time I go to charge this thing, I make sure that I have it like you know sitting up in the stand, and there's you know it's not near anything else where I might accidentally knock it over or something like that. It's a dumb practical tip, but it is one that gives me some peace of mind. So yeah, if you're gonna leave this thing charging, especially if you're gonna leave it charging overnight to like download games or something like that, make sure it's in a safe spot where it's not gonna topple over or anything. And speaking of charging, anytime you have to charge your Steam Deck, in all likelihood you're just going to use the included charger, right? But every now and then, maybe you want to use a different charger, or maybe you have it docked up in such a way that it would be kind of a pain to just, you know, constantly disconnect the 45 watt included charger. So if you're going to use another charger to bring juice into the system, make sure you use one that's close or at least approaching that 45 watt rating that the original included power supply brings. So, for example, you wouldn't want to use like a wall ward that's like a 5 volt or a 12 volt charger that you might use for a phone or something like that, because it's just not a very efficient a way to get juice back into it if you decide to use one of those technically it might trickle charge over a period of hours like overnight or something like that but if you're looking to charge this thing up quickly you definitely want something beefier for the task so at the very least you want to make sure that you get about 20 watts or so personally i've used a macbook charger as well with and that seems to produce enough output that it can charge in a similar way to the included power supply but yeah don't try to use just like a 5 or a 12 volt wall ward or something like that because it's, it's certainly not gonna give you enough power to sustain it while you're playing with it plugged in. And while it technically might charge it, it's going to take way longer than if you just used an appropriate charger to do the job. And like I mentioned in that accessories video, I actually had a really beefy backup battery that I thought would be perfectly fine to charge the Steam Deck. Turns out that wasn't the case because it could only put out five volts and that's why I decided to up to the the uh, the Anker power bank that I actually bought for it, which is about 25,000 milliamps, I think. But the thing also puts out 87 watts of power because it's meant to, you know, charge up a laptop and considering the Steam Deck basically is just a portable PC, it's a perfectly adequate choice for this. But whatever you're using, be it a power bank or, you know, a wall adapter of some sort, just make sure that if you're not going to use the included adapter, that it's at least got one that's going to supply enough power to it that's going to charge in, you know, maybe an hour or two and not take like 12 hours to charge charge or something like that. All right, this next one is kind of a weird one because it's sort of for somebody who's in the process of getting a Steam Deck and maybe not if you already have one, obviously, but me personally, I went for the 512 gig model of the Steam Deck. And one of the differences for that, aside from the space increase, is the fact that it has an anti-reflective screen. And while that's great for my purposes for filming, because I'm not having you know, tons of light bounce off of it, which makes it easier for making videos, practically speaking, I don't think it's enough of a draw, certainly not a $250 draw, that you should really worry about how the screen's going to look. Now, some people might have issues with glossy screens. Personally, I don't because I think they create the illusion of making colors more vivid. No, having a glossy screen isn't going to magically make an LCD as punchy as, say, an OLED screen. But I'm just saying that if you really don't have just an outrageous need for an anti-reflective screen where you're not going to be playing it outside a lot, I think you can probably save the dough and not worry about going for that unless you just absolutely want the top tier model. 
All right, so now that we've talked about some of the exterior sort of immutable hardware properties of the Steam Deck, let's move in a little bit and talk about some of the ports on it, starting with the SD card slot. Now, as I already mentioned, I don't necessarily think you need the 512 gig model just to get the anti reflective screen. And another reason I don't think you need it, and you might be able to save yourself some dough, is the fact that as far as I can tell in my testing, games do not load any slower off the SD card than they do, you know, against say the internal SSD. Maybe it's slightly slower, but honestly, the difference is so minuscule and negligible that I don't think it justifies, you know, that massive of price increase just to get the extra space that the top tier model affords. Rather, it might make more sense for you to save one or 200 bucks and ultimately just get yourself a really beefy SD card to pop in there because again, as far as I can tell, it's not really loading that much faster on the internal SSD versus the SSD card. Also, one more note on that SD card slot, I would seriously recommend you get as large a card as you possibly can. Initially, like I mentioned in that video previously, I did have a 128 gig micro SD card laying around. However, it took me about three days to completely chew through that because I was putting a ton of different games on there from Steam and then also putting a ton of emulated games on it. So I pretty much chewed through that 128 gig card super fast and ended up ordering a one terabyte card a little bit later on. So yeah, I guess it's sort of like that goldfish theory where, you know, people thought like, oh, goldfish get as large as the tank that you put them in. Well, that's technically a myth. I don't think it's a myth that if you have a ton of space, you're probably going to eat through it pretty quickly. So I think it makes sense to max it out as much as you can to make sure that you have plenty of space for all of your games, especially given how large the install size is for a lot of the modern titles that have come out. Moving on to the top of the unit, there is a single USB-C port that handles both power and data. So if you want to charge it through that, or if you want to use a USB-C dock so you can hook up other peripherals for using in desktop mode, that's great. But one of the things that I immediately noticed was that port has a little bit of play. Like once I connected the power adapter, it had a little bit of wiggle to it. And at first I kind of freaked out because I thought, oh man, is this a design flaw that I get a busted Steam Deck? Is there something wrong with this port? But after doing some research online, it turns out that was actually by design. There's a little bit of play in that port to make sure that it doesn't break on the inside where the connector is. So if you get a Steam Deck and you notice there's a little bit of wiggle or give whenever you have a cable that's connected to that port, don't worry about it. Apparently that's by design. And I can tell you so far, having unplugged and plugged in, you know, uh, the power adapter and the switch just tons of times since I've had this thing, I've had no issues with it. And now that I know that that was there kind of by design, I definitely feel better about it. But yeah, if you're used to like a super solid connection on some of your other electronic devices, might be kind of jarring, but don't worry, totally normal. All right, so let's move on to the operating system software and user interface experience and some of the tips that I've found for that. Now, there are really two interfaces, right? The first is just sort of like the user-facing video game interface. That sort of feels like Steam big picture mode, just sort of shrunken down for a portable device. But then there's also like the desktop PC interface mode, right? I'm mostly gonna stick with the former just because I feel like if I tried to tackle the latter, that video could be forever long and I'd basically just be talking about how to use a computer. So for this part, I'm basically just going to be sticking to the front end gaming interface. And with that in mind, I still think it's helpful to have key keyboard and mouse nearby wherever you keep your Steam Deck docked, especially if it's connected to a monitor and you want to interact with it regularly for any sort of file management, particularly if you're doing emulation or ROM type operations and you want to be able to have quick access to sort of shift things around. Much easier to use a keyboard and mouse for these uh, processes than trying to do it manually just using, you know, the on-screen keyboard or the touchpads to control the mouse. Again, I tried this once briefly when I first got the Steam Deck and got as far as I could setting up emulation on it. While it's technically possible, again, not going to be a great experience. So yes, would definitely recommend keeping a mouse and keyboard nearby. However, you'll definitely run into situations where you need to simulate a mouse and keyboard, and for that reason, I definitely recommend paying very close attention to the Steam Deck button. It is essentially the same thing as the home button you would use on an Xbox controller or a PlayStation 5 controller, except it has an added function that's really handy, and that is if you just hold the Steam button down, it will actually bring up a screen that shows you a list of commands or quick shortcuts you can do to do things like force quit a game, or enable the on-screen keyboard, or enable mouse input, but you don't have one connected. It's a really handy thing, and something that I you know, was forgetting about constantly when I first started using the Steam Deck. But yeah, just holding that Steam button down will usually give you the command that you're looking for if you want a shortcut to like increase or decrease the screen brightness, or again, if you just want to like force quit an app or bring up the mouse and keyboard interface. So if you ever get frazzled by the controls or something like that, or if a game is just completely locked up on you, you need to force quit out of it, just remember that thing is basically your lifeline. Just hold it down and it should give you the next input that you need to sort of get back on your way and into the game that you want to play. And speaking of getting to your games quickly, one of the things I really like about the interface is it gives you a lot of ways to sort of clean up and keep your video game collection organized and tidy. For example, you can take any of the games that are installed and you can add them to specific collections, which if you're doing emulation, you can do the same thing with non-Steam applications that show up in the interface, which I kind of talked about in like my favorite systems to play video from I think a week or two ago. But this is true of like all of the Steam Deck applications that you have installed, right? If you want, you can quickly just hit start on any of the games that are listed, add it to favorites. If you just want to keep like one unified bucket of your most played games or the ones 
ones that you're you know picking away at currently or if you want you can make a specific collection separate from that so if you want to group all of your racing games or rpgs or horror games together you could do that to make it just a little bit cleaner and easier to find what you're looking for all right, so moving on to tips for games, one of the things I would recommend first is that you actually play Aperture Desk Job as your first game on the Steam Deck. It's a fun game in its own right, and like I mentioned in like my recommended Steam games video, it's a fun little romp that you know has Valve's typical humor woven all throughout it, but from a practical standpoint, it does give you a breakdown of all the different buttons on the Steam Deck and some of the capabilities that it has. So yeah, as an opening tip, when you first fire up your Steam Deck, make Aperture Desk Job one of the first games you check out because it should ease you into the process pretty quickly. So much so that it's basically like a tutorial for the system itself. But after you've played Aperture Desk Job as smoothly as those controls are demonstrated in that title, you're definitely going to fire up games where the controls aren't quite doing what you want them to do. And it's really easy to remap controls in the game. You can either try to do it directly within the game interface, which might give you what you're looking for, but more often than not what I found myself doing was actually hitting the Steam button to bring up the quick menu, and from there you can actually slide to the right and then change the you know, mapping of all of your controls for that particular game and make sure that it just stays that way every time you fire it up in the future. Now you can go through and piecemeal if you want and tweak each individual button mapping to your liking, or one of the things that I found was really helpful is the fact that you can go to community layouts, which will actually show a ton of people who have kind of remapped the controls in a way that they think is pleasing and then they've uploaded it and you know depending on how many votes it has or how much time they've spent with that title which it shows you both of these things when you look at those templates it might give you a better experience without having to do a lot of tedious sort of tweaking and customizing to make sure every button works the way you want i actually found this for a variety of games including weirdly metroid prime uh, for the gamecube which i was not expecting but it did pop up a community layout for metroid prime and that was pretty cool but yeah, checking out those community layouts will often save you a bunch of time rather than trying to you know, painstakingly go through each of the buttons yourself, especially considering just how many buttons and input methods the Steam Deck has. Now moving on from the controls for certain games, you might have to tweak the performance settings even for Steam recommended games. And one of the quickest ways you can do this is by hitting the three dots button on the right side of the screen. If you hit this, it's gonna slide over another menu where you can get to quick settings like you know enabling or disabling Bluetooth, adjusting the volume and your screen brightness and so on. But the most important thing here in my experience so far has been that there's actually a dedicated section for battery and performance. Now here you can choose different overlays if you want an idea of like, you know, what the system's doing from a performance standpoint in terms of, you know, uh, how many frames are you getting and you know how much is attacking the individual cores of the CPU and the GPU and so on. But then also there are settings right underneath this where aside from just getting a look at how the system's performing, you can also do things like limit the frame rate to say 30 frames per second if you want to save battery power. You can drop it down to 15 frames per second if you're playing something like a visual novel game that really doesn't require like tons and tons of action to be displayed smoothly on screen. And it really just gives you a range of control over how much power is going to be consumed in service to the current game you're playing. So you can effectively balance that tug of war between power consumption and graphical performance. But Beyond things like changing the controls or optimizing the performance of a particular game, you still might find scenarios where maybe you're playing an unverified game and you really are just like this close to getting it to work the way you want to. And in those situations, one of the best things that I could advise you to do is to lean on the community a little bit. There are a lot of great people in the Steam Deck community, particularly on the Steam Deck subreddit, and there are a lot of great channels out there that are putting out amazing Steam Deck content right now. So look around there and don't be afraid to ask other people you know, how they've you know, gotten a certain game to run. I've seen a ton of people on the Reddit in particular who are having trouble with a very specific type of game and somebody found the answer to that question like anything else on the internet if there's a problem that you're having there's a good chance you're not the only person who's ever encountered it so make sure you talk with some other people who are playing the steam deck as well and there's a good chance you're going to find the answer that you're looking for so yeah this whole video was basically just meant to be you know a list of common things that i ran up against while i was getting used to the steam deck but hey what about you you know what tips or advice do you have for somebody else who's just warming up to the steam deck for the first time because i would love to hear about it as somebody who's fairly new to it myself as always thanks for taking the time to watch the video it means a lot have an amazing day and i'll see you on the next one